Good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Wong. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Circulation, Arrhythmia, and Electrophysiology. I'm honored and delighted to welcome you all today to our second in a series of CERC a &E webinars. Uh, these will be hosted by our advisory panels, which are under the direction of Dr. Dan Morin, who's uh, joined us today. Uh, and uh, our, our, webin our webinar today will be hosted by our devices advisory panel. And I'll turn things over now to Dr. Jordana Crone and Dr. Parikh Sharma. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of Circulation, Arrhythmia, and Electrophysiology, and Dr. Paul Wang, you tonight to our webinar, Physiologic Pacing, His Bundle and Left Bundle Branch Pacing. I am Jordana Crone, an electrophysiologist and associate professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. My co-host tonight is my friend and colleague, Dr. Parikh Sharma, Associate Professor and Section Chief for Electrophysics at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Thank you, Jordana. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, we're all very excited to have a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, these are all experts in the field of physiological pacing and are here today to elucidate where we are and where we're headed in this very exciting and exploding field of conduction system slash physiological pacing. Uh, I would encourage all of you guys to use the Q&A function to be able to communicate with us and we'll do the best we can through the rest of this webinar to ensure that your questions are answered by our panel of experts and hope this can be an exciting uh, event for all of you guys. Our first panelist tonight is Dr. Valentina Katifa, an associate professor at the University of Rochester. She has a PhD in cardiac electrophysiology, a master's degree in healthcare management, and a certificate in clinical research from Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Takifa. Um, her research work encompasses a wide range of relators, CRT, subcutaneous ICDs, and physiologic pacing. We're so delighted to have you here with us tonight. Well, thank you. And uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, and I just really want to thank the organizers and the chairs for the invitation to present today on his bundle pacing in AV block. These are my disclosures. And I'm presenting you today a case of a 57 year old woman who uh, showed up at our clinic with one month of fatigue and significant shortness of breath. This is the 12 lead ACG uh, showing a 221 AV block and significant sinus bradycardia responsible uh, for the patient's symptoms. Uh, we decided at this point uh, to implant a DDD pacer and implanted uh, the, left, the right ventricular lead uh, in an apical position. I actually have to say this implant was performed in 2013. Uh, and this is the 12 lead ACG of the paced rhythm. Uh, despite uh, a really long AV delay, uh, you can see right ventricular apical pacing with a very wide QRS of about 200 or 220 milliseconds. Um, so a few years later, this patient came back to our clinic, again with significant shortness of breath. And as you see here on the echocardiogram, a significant left ventricular dyssynchrony is visible and the patient has a reduced ventricular ejection fraction. And when we reviewed the device reading, we actually found that the patient had an increasing percentage of right ventricular pacing over time. Back in 2013, right ventricular pacing was about 40%. And as the years passed by, the patient developed a complete heart block and needed a permanent right ventricular pacing. 
And I would say this is a typical representation of many of our pacemaker patients uh, who we implant. Uh, typically a 2 to one AV block advances into complete AV block over time and patients need a higher and higher percentage of right ventricular pacing. So at this point, we really wanted to look at uh, an option to more uh, physiologically pace the ventricle and reverse uh, the cardiomyopathy if possible. And we decided to proceed with a his bundle pacing lead implantation. For the his bundle pacing lead implantation, we used the Select Secure 3830 lead. This is a 4.1 French lead that facilitates multiple lead implants in the venous system and minimizes the risk of subclavian crush. The lead has a lumenless design, so it doesn't utilize a locking stylet and requires the use of a delivery sheet. And uh, one of the best sheets are used for his panel pacing lead implantation is the C315 uh, his catheter, which has a fixed curve sheet. And uh, inserting this into the right ventricle and beyond the tricuspid annulus over a guide wire, um, we can actually uh, map for an appropriate uh, his signal using uh, the pacing lead itself. And this is what we see here on this video. Um, we are mapping for the his potential. And if you look on the EGM on the right side, uh, at the beginning, we see um, only the ventricular signal. And after that, the his signal becomes visible. Once we find an appropriate uh, his position, we secure the lead by uh, screwing the lead four to five times clockwise and uh, measure the pacing thresholds and um, make sure that we have an appropriate his bundle pacing, selective or non-selective. And um, you see here the ACG of this particular patient, uh, which shows a non-selective his uh, bundle pacing, which means that the capture happens both through the his Purkinje system, as well as the local myocardium. But even then, if you look at it, the paced QRS duration is significantly shorter to what we have seen before. And um, as uh, we see here, a couple of other examples for non-selective and selective his bundle pacing, um, you might appreciate that both of these uh, are often associated with a significant or normalized QRS duration. And both of them, both selective and non-selective his bundle pacing has been shown to be associated with better outcomes. And this is the follow-up of the patient who came back uh, for her next visit following the implant with a significantly improved left ventricular ejection fraction and a synchronous ventricular activation as visible on the echo. So I wanted to review with you today the evidence on the benefit of his bundle pacing as compared to right ventricular pacing, uh, the previous gold standard. And I just wanted to say that, um, you know, we all have been working with right ventricular pacing for a couple of decades and his bundle pacing is definitely the new kid on the block, even though it is, uh, it has very promising results. And I'm not going to go into details with regard of the deleterious effects of right ventricular apical pacing. I'm just showing you two of the landmark studies that first describe uh, the adverse outcomes uh, with a high percentage of pacing in uh, this patient population. This is data from the MOS study showing that um, ventricular pacing is linked to heart failure events and atrial fibrillation. And the David trial also showed that each 10% increase in right ventricular pacing increases the risk of death and heart failure event. So we know that right ventricular pacing is not the best option. And the pathophysiological rationale for benefit of his bundle pacing is that this uh, pacing modality actually restores uh, the electrical activation and activates the ventricles in the most physiologic way. 
And it's uh, possible that with his monitor pacing, we can prevent the development of uh, pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, as well as we can reverse uh, once pacing-induced tachycardiomyopathy is uh, developed. And just showing you a few slides on his bundle pacing success rate. Uh, the elegant meta-analysis on the left shows that with the newer lead, with the 3830 30 lead, the success rate is somewhere between about 80% and 95%. So this is really promising for a widespread implementation of this new pacing strategy. And the pacing threshold with his bundle pacing is uh, somewhat higher than what we have typically seen with conventional pacing, although as this graph shows here, it is maintained over time. Uh, this is one of the early studies showing that his manner pacing is safe and feasible uh, with uh, a number of his manner pacing implants here. And the floral time in both patient population was the same. So this does not expose patients to more floral time. We also know, as compared to right ventricular pacing, that his bundle pacing is effective and it does have superior benefit over right ventricular apical pacing. One of these early studies, a crossover blinded randomized study, very well done, shows that his bundle pacing was linked to a superior improvement in your functional class six minute walk test and quality of life as compared to right ventricular pacing. And this study also shows why, because his bundle pacing patients had a significantly narrower pace QRS. And I believe that the pace QRS duration is a great surrogate marker of subsequent outcomes. His bundle pacing was also shown to be linked with a lower rate of heart failure events as shown in this early study. And in a more recent study, uh, it was also shown to reduce atrial fibrillation burden in patients who did not have any prior AFib. So as I mentioned before, not only reversing pacing induced cardiomyopathy, but preventing its development as well. And the study also showed that this lower risk of new onset atrial fibrillation was especially seen in patients who had a uh, right ventricular pacing 20% or more as a control group. So that's just something to keep in mind. And so based on these data, his bundle pacing is today part of the guidelines. Uh, this is the 2018 uh, guidelines of evaluation and management of patients with bradycardia and cardiac conduction delay. And it recommends his bundle pacing as a 2A with a 2A indication for patients uh, who have an indication for permanent pacing and have a left ventricular ejection fraction of 36 to 50%. And it also has 2B indication for uh, any patient with an AV block and uh, any ejection fraction. And as I mentioned before, selective versus non-selective his bundle pacing, they both have similar benefit when it comes to better outcomes. And this is actually a very large cohort of 350 patients, uh, just showing that both the selective and non-selective his bundle pacing patients had similar rates of heart failure events and similar mortality as well. So you may ask about long-term outcomes with his bundle pacing, and this is one of the largest cohorts published to date with almost a thousand patients, well over 800 patients implanted between 2004 and 2016 and 41% of these patients had AV block as an indication. And as you see here on the right panel of the slide, the pacing threshold was maintained uh, over 10 years uh, during this follow-up study. And although there was a higher capture threshold in over 20% of the patients, only a small proportion of this group actually had interruption of his pacing. I also want to point out that this was actually a study that uh, included a lot of the patients who were implanted with his pacing early on. 
and current uh, implantation methods as well as leads and sheets are more developed and we believe the current long-term uh, safety and feasibility of this lead is even better than shown here. Well, I just wanted to mention a few challenges uh, with his boner facing. Uh, there are relatively few small retrospective studies to date. Uh, the success rate is highly variable, although I think with today's leads, it's about 80 to 95 percent. The implantations are performed at a few but very experienced centers, although widespread adaptation of this spacing modality is ongoing. The follow-up is still relatively short. Uh, there's limited data on long-term lead performance and a potential need for RV backup pacing. So this is actually my conclusion slide. Uh, I hope I made a strong argument here today that for patients with an AB block and a pacing indication, his bundle pacing is actually a very promising alternative. The experience is relatively limited, but all of the studies consistently showed superior outcomes. This is a physiologic pacing modality um, with very strong rationale for long-term benefits. And the current limitations of varying success rate and concerns of long-term lead performance will certainly be addressed in future clinical studies. And I, I will just stop there and um, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. One quick question before we move on to the next speaker. Who do you choose to put his bundle pacing in? What is your practice between using RV pacing, his bundle pacing, or even left bundle pacing? Mm -hmm. So I really think that anyone who we expect to have a high ventricular percentage and, you know, based on newer studies, uh, really think about more than 20% of need uh, for pacing, I would actually, you know, suggest his bundle pacing as, as the first alternative. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right, moving on to our next presenter, uh, we have Dr. Santosh Padala, who's an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's a very close friend and a colleague. Uh, we had the honor of training together. Uh, he is uh, very quickly become a superstar at uh, in the EP field, uh, young rising uh, star who has done a lot of good work. He's won a research award. Uh, at VCU as well. And uh, we are extremely pleased to have him here to talk to us about some of the emerging data on this new and exciting space of left bundle branch area pacing that has been popularized by Dr. Wong over the past few years. So I also want to highlight that um, there is a the largest single center experience by Dr. Uh, Rajan Wong that has been published in circ a &E this past month. And Dr. Padala will actually be sharing a few slides highlighting that paper, which I think is uh, critical to some of our discussions going forward. So thank you, Santosh, welcome. Thank you, Parikh. Um, let me share my slides. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about left bundle branch pacing for AV block. These are my disclosures. So AV block can be at the level of AV node or it can be infranodal block. Or sometimes it can be iatrogenic in patients with refractory AFib uh, going for AV node ablation. So the site of uh, pacing in this cohort is critical as these patients are anticipated to have high RV pacing burden and are at risk for pacing induced cardiomyopathy with RV apical pacing. I'll start off with a couple of cases and then go over some literature. So this is case one. Patient is a 46 year old woman with hypertension, proximal AFib, six sinus syndrome, chronic left frontal branch block for three years with a recent decline in left ventricular ejection fraction to 40 to 45% deemed to be due to left frontal branch cardiomyopathy NYHA class symptom, two symptoms, was referred for pacemaker implantation. This was her baseline ECG. You can see a pretty short PR interval with typical left bundle branch morphology. As uh, discussed in the previous talk, she meets a class two indication for uh, physiologic pacing. We decided to do a left bundle branch pacing lead in this patient. 
This was the baseline ECG, again, showing typical left frontal branch morphology with a QRS duration of about 155 milliseconds. So we successfully implanted the left frontal branch area facing link, and the subsequent tracings I'm gonna show are to prove the conduction system capture. As you can see, we are trying to pace here at high output and low output, and we are trying to measure the LV activation times. It's measured from the beginning of the stim to the peak of R in V5, and it's short and constant, suggestive of left um, branch, left frontal branch area capture. Also, the QRS duration was narrow at 112 milliseconds. We also noticed during the intrinsic rhythm, very consistent sharp high frequency potential, uh, which was 60 milliseconds after the QRS, likely a retrograde left frontal branch potential. In this case, um, basically the impulse is coming down the right bundle, going transeptal and retrograde up to the left bundle lead. And we were able to document the retrograde left bundle potential. We also did programmed electrical stimulation. You can see the drive train and the extra stim. And you can see with extra stim, there is widening of the QRS and lengthening of the LVAT, suggesting uh, transition from conduction system capture to septal capture only. So in this case, we were able to demonstrate left bundle branch area capture based on several things. First, you know, right bundle branch morphology, short and constant LVATs, non-selective to selective left bundle branch um, demonstration. We had a retrograde left bundle potential and programmed the system showing myocardial response. This was her ECG, uh, where we were able to completely normalize the QRS by optimizing the AV delays. The echocardiogram six months later showed uh, EF of 50 to 55 percent improved from 40 to 45 percent, and with NYHA class one symptoms. And she had stable lead parameters at nine months. Let's take a look at second case: 86-year-old female with coronary artery disease, chronic right venous branch block with severe aortic stenosis. Says was tower as expected. She developed complete heart block. Uh, this was her baseline ECG. PR was 186 milliseconds, and the QRS duration was 142 milliseconds with typical right bundle branch morphology. Post tower, she developed complete heart block, which lasted for about an hour. She was symptomatic. She had left bundle branch morphology escape rhythm with a QRS duration of 148 milliseconds. Subsequently, her conduction regained, and she remained uh, overnight in normal rhythm with right bundle branch pattern. There was no significant change in PR interval or right bundle branch QRS duration. At this point, we were debating whether to do a EP study or send her home with a remote, uh, like a whole event monitor. But at, uh, next morning, she again went into complete heart block um, and then we decided to put a pacemaker. So in this case, again, you can see the RAO, LAO images here. Um, you know, you can see she's rotated, she's 86, she has severe calcific aortic stenosis. She also had severe MAC. So one would suspect uh, to have some degree of septal fibrosis. But in this case, as you can see, we were about two centimeters below the aortic valve. We started off at this point, and then with six to eight turns, the lead actually went in nicely deep into the septum, and you can see the ring almost getting into the septum, which was again confirmed on the septogram, about 1.5 to 1.6 centimeter of the lead is uh, in the septum. In this case, um, again, uh, with high output and low output pacing, we were able to demonstrate short and constant LVATs, and the QRS duration was about less than 110 milliseconds. This was the ECG next morning, uh, showing QR pattern with a pretty narrow uh, QRS complexes. So this is our initial experience with left middle branch area pacing, which was recently published in Jack EP. This was in collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, Atul Verma from Canada. Left middle branch area pacing was attempted in 340 patients, and was successful in about 89% of the patients. As you can see, the mean age was 89. I'm sorry, mean age was 72 years. And LV dysfunction, EF less than 50% was noted in 23% of the patients. Looking at the indications, about quarter percent of the patients had sinus node dysfunction, and 62% of the patients had AV block or refractory AFib with slow ventricular rate or uh, had AV node ablation. And this, uh, cohort, we can see in the overall success rate was 89%. And as you can see, the success rates improved with a learning curve during the later half of the experience, the success rates were up to 91%.
Importantly, the success rate in patients with AV block uh, were pretty high at 90% and did not differ significantly with regards to presence or absence of funnel branch block. Uh, these are some of the uh, characteristics. Pro mean procedural duration was 74 minutes. And as you can see, uh, the baseline QRS duration in patients with infrahesian disease or AV block uh, was 144 milliseconds, which we were able to uh, bring it down to 115 milliseconds. The mean LVATs were between 71 to 75 milliseconds. And uh, importantly, the uh, electrophysiological parameters remained stable during the short term follow up. As you can see, the R waves were between uh, 14 to 15 millivolts, and the thresholds remained below 0.8 volts at 0.4 milliseconds. We had only three acute lead dislodgements, and there were no major lead related complications. What about the long term safety? So, this is a recent paper from Dr. Wong's group published in CERC AE. And uh, this is the largest series with longest follow up published to date on left funnel branch area pacing, and the results are very encouraging. The left funnel branch uh, pacing was attempted in about 632 patients and successful in 98% of the patients. Similar to our cohort, the mean age was about 70 years, and quarter percent of the patients had 6 sinus syndrome, and AV block or AFib with AV node ablation was in 60% of the patients. These were the baseline comorbidities. The long-term pacing and echocardiographic parameters are shown in this figure. If you look at uh, figure A showing thresholds over long-term, so at baseline, there were 618 patients, 90% of the patients had one-year follow-up data, and about 35 to 40% of the patients had two-year follow-up data. Importantly, you can see the thresholds remain stable during the long-term follow-up period. The thresholds were below 0.7 volts at 0.4 milliseconds. Also, the R waves remain stable during the long-term follow-up. Looking at the figure D, looking at left ventricular ejection fraction in this cohort, you can see at baseline in patients with AV block who were requiring high burden RV pacing, the EF remained stable. In fact, it actually went from 58 to 62 percent. These results are very reassuring and suggest that chronic left frontal branch area pacing does not cause pacing induced cardiomyopathy, at least during a one year follow up period. Again, in this study, similar to our study, there were no major lead related complications. Specifically, there were no uh, issues regarding high thresholds. So how does uh, his bundle pacing perform in AV block patients? This is from an experienced EP group implementing his bundle pacing for the first time. Um, his bundle pacing was implement, um, tried in, attempted in 100 patients. The success rate was 75%. As you can see, the success rate significantly differed uh, when patients have underlying bundle branch block. And when they looked at the success rates uh, based on the indication, the success rate significantly decreased in patients who had complete heart block at 56% compared to Mobitz type 1 block, where the success rates were 92%. So what about the success rates in the most experienced hands? So this is from Dr. Vijay Raman's lab. They looked at his bundle pacing in AV block patients they looked at 100 patients, 46% had AV nodal block, 54% had infranodal block. The reported success in this cohort was pretty high compared to prior reports, 84%. But if you look again, patients who had infranodal block, the success rates were significantly low compared to those who had AV nodal block, 76% versus 93%. So why do we see these differences between his panel pacing and left panel branch area pacing? acutely in terms of success rates and chronically in terms of lead performance. This can be explained based on the anatomy and histology of the conduction system. His bundle is a very thin, narrow structure. So the target zone is very narrow. You need higher, you need, uh, higher precision to get to that area. Whereas left bundle, it's a wide landing zone. You, know, you can try to implant in the, at the common trunk, but sometimes you have, if you have septal fibrosis, you can try to go down towards the mid septum, try to get into the left posterior vascular area and still narrow the QRS pretty significantly. In addition to the anatomy, the also histology is also very important. If you look at the histology of the his bundle, you have uh, his bundle is surrounded by dense fibrous tissue with relatively 
uh, less myocardium. So hence, uh, explaining high thresholds at implant and relatively low amplitude R waves. Whereas left malar branch still ha has thin connective tissue, but dense myocardial tissue, which explains lower thresholds and large amplitude R waves. So as any new technique, this has knowns and unknowns. So what are the known knowns? That is things we are aware of and understand. We know now that left malar branch pacing at least prevents or reverses pacing induced cardiomyopathy based on recently published data. What are the known unknowns? That is things we are aware of, but don't understand completely. One thing which uh, we are still trying to figure out is what are the optimal LVAD, especially in patients with cardiomyopathy. And how do we measure the LVADs? There needs to be a standardized approach to measure the LVADs. We typically measure from the beginning of the stem to the peak of R, but if you start measuring from the middle of the stem or the end of the stem, you can see you can move from 76 down to 65 milliseconds. So there has to be a standardized approach. What are the unknown knowns? That is things we understand but are not aware of. We are not aware of risk of RV cardiomyopathy. We are not aware of the risk of lead stress fracture and risk of lead extraction in future. And what are the unknown unknowns? That is things we are neither aware of nor understand. I think this will learn from future long-term experiences. In conclusion, left frontal branch pacing can be achieved with high success rates in patients with AV neural and infranodal block. Left frontal branch pacing lead parameters remain stable at a two-year follow-up. Chronic left frontal branch pacing does not seem to result in pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. And left frontal branch pacing is associated with low long-term lead-related complications. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much, Santosh, for that uh, beautiful overview of left border branch pacing, uh, which is certainly gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, I think there's uh, one audience question and one additional question that I'd like to ask quickly, just so we have enough time. Um, so the question from the audience was, what percentage of your devices in patients that have a block HF type indication end up being BIV devices uh, or CRT generators as opposed to a regular dual chamber pacemaker? So, you know, if the EF is 35 to 50% as the guidelines say, yes, we can either do left funnel versus CRT. If I get a good result, say if a patient has left funnel branch block, like the first example I showed, classic example, right? So in that patient with the left funnel branch pacing lead, if you get a QR or a RSR prime pattern, by optimizing the AV delays, we can actually completely normalize the QRS. So in that patient, we actually um, gave her a dual chamber generator instead of a CRTP generator. And, and if a patient is dependent or has AV block and it still meets criteria for a CRT pacemaker, would you still put in just a dual chamber device if you get a good result? Are you confident with that outcome? If the EF is between 35 to 50, we've been doing dual chamber pacemakers, but if the EF is below 35%, we can do a CRTP based on the guidelines, but um, that's what we've been doing. Excellent. One last really quick question with a really quick response, if we can. So we know that with his bundle pacing, we have data worth almost close to two decades. More data is generated over the last 15 years or so. Um, and with left bundle branch pacing, the data is more emerging and mostly two to three years of follow-up. Do you see any potential downsides? I know you beautifully highlighted on that last slide, and I, I love that slide. I'd like to steal it from you down the road. But I... Uh, do you see any potential downsides that could emerge that could make this a challenge for us as well down the road? I mean, just like we're seeing with some cases with this funnel pacing. Yeah, I think uh, the follow-up needs to be uh, very um, you know, systematic. Uh, you gotta make sure that you still have conduction system capture. Uh, we have to be able to demonstrate that in the follow-up, make sure that they're not losing conduction system capture, especially in patients who receive this conduction system pacing leads for resynchronization purposes. So that's, I think, the biggest challenge. Santosh, can I ask uh, yes. one more question that came up in the Q&A? I hope you can hear me. Is yes. Have you used any other leads besides the 3830 for his bundle or left bundle pacing? No, we have not used any other leads uh, for left bundle branch area pacing. We've okay. been using the 3830. All right, excellent. Let's move on to our final but 
mostly long-awaited speaker, Dr. Pugal Vijayaraman, who is uh, one of my for early mentors. I learned a lot about his funnel pacing and conduction system pacing from him. And uh, he is uh, currently at uh, the Geisinger Health System, where he is a professor of medicine and the director of the EP Lab uh, and Director of EP at the Geisinger Health System in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And uh, he has certainly, um, he's called by a lot of folks the, the, the father of modern conduction system pacing or his funnel pacing. And certainly his Twitter title, his talk one uh, sort of goes in line with that. So uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to share your experience, valuable experiences with us today. Uh, he's going to be talking about his funnel pacing and left funnel branch pacing uh, for cardiac resynchronization therapy and its value in that space. Parikh, and I want to thank Paul, uh, Jordana, uh, and the rest of the faculty for allowing me to be part of this webinar. And my topic is mentioned is his bundle and left bone branch pacing for cardiac resynchronization therapy. Yeah. And these are my disclosures. So in left bundle branch block, uh, there is significant electrical dyssynchrony that leads to mechanical dyssynchrony. And biventricular pacing by stimulating both ventricles uh, results in significant reduction in electrical dyssynchrony. Doesn't completely normalize, but still leads to significant improvement in mechanical dyssynchrony. And because of the fact that it does not normalize, there is still a significant uh, rate of non-response in many patients with undergoing biventricular pacing. The reasons for that is multifold, but nonetheless, one of the things that we can use to improve upon is the fact that in using conduction system pacing, which has very extensive network arborization so that you can achieve, a, it's not a, just a multi-point pacing, it's a million point pacing using his funnel pacing or left funnel branch pacing. And so in this example, you can see this uh, in left funnel branch block, there is a significant delay in the left ventricular activation, which can be corrected by his funnel pacing. This was very elegantly studied in this uh, series of 18 patients undergoing both uh, his funnel pacing and biventricular pacing. And looking at uh, ECG imaging, they were able to show that uh, his funnel pacing results in significant reduction in QRS duration and that leads to significant improvement in LV activation time, along with reduction in the dyssynchrony index, leading to a hemodynamic improvement in terms of invasively measured, repeated measures of blood pressure. And this is on top of whatever could be achieved with biventricular pacing, is an intrapatient comparison, excellent study showing what can be achieved if we can completely normalize the conduction system. As you can see in this patient with a very wide left bundle branch block with a QRS duration of 190 milliseconds, his bundle pacing can completely normalize it to 95 milliseconds. And at a lower output, you can see uh, the underlying left bundle branch block without correction. So when studied in a series of patients, which was predominantly non-ischemic cardiomyopathy um, but done by Dr. Wong's group in uh, Wenzhou, China, and they looked at a three-year follow-up study in this group of 74 patients where we were, well, acutely able to correct left frontal branch block in majority of the patient. Permanent pacing was possible only about 76% of the patients. In this group, they were able to show that a significant improvement in LV ejection fraction from 32% at baseline to 55% during three-year follow-up. Most important thing is in this group of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy patients with primarily left bundle branch block defined by Strauss criteria, hyper response rate was almost 85%. That's unheard of number in CRT population in previous studies. Nonetheless, the limitation as previously pointed out by Santosh and uh, Valentina is that left bundle branch block correction threshold can be higher because you're often proximal to the side of block. In this group, it was almost close to two volts and there's slight increase in during follow-up. 
However, by utilizing left bundle branch spacing, by bypassing the side of block, going slightly distal to the side of block, you can correct the underlying left bundle branch block. And if you can use fusion pacing, allowing native conduction through the right bundle, you can achieve normalization of the QRS morphology. Here in this example, you can see significant narrowing of the QRS duration down to 105 milliseconds. And the same thing studied in another series of patients, uh, 66 patients, uh, very high success rate of left bundle branch pacing, again, Dr. Wong's group. And they were able to show that during one year follow-up, significant improvement in LV ejection fraction and overall hyper response rate was about 60% in this group, by improvement by more than 20%. And we looked at it in a much more uh, larger subset of population, more in terms of real world experience in a multi-center fashion for 325 patients, uh, including both patients with left bundle branch block, IVCD, right bundle branch block, RV pacing, and all of those, we were able to show that the clinical outcome, 85% success rate for all comers with uh, need for cardiac resynchronization therapy, greater degree of QRS duration reduction was achieved in patients with left bundle branch block. And that similarly translated into greater improvement in functional class, LV ejection fraction, and LV dimensions in this group. Nonetheless, even the non-left bundle branch block group showed significant improvement compared to baseline. While we understand um, there's limitations for his bundle pacing or left bundle branch pacing. We need to know why and how. This is a very elegant paper from the University of Chicago group that looked at the various types of left bundle branch block, predominantly uh, during intracardiac mapping, left septal mapping. And they were able to show that about two thirds of the patients have proximal conduction disease in the his bundle or the proximal left bundle and one third of patients had predominantly intact Purkinje G actuation, suggesting that this is predominantly interventricular conduction delay or more diffuse conduction disease that may not be amenable to his bundle pacing or even left bundle branch pacing. As you can see, this is a wide QRS, looks like a, a typical looking left bundle branch block, but the his G activation is totally normal, although a little bit slowed. Pacing at high output uh, from the right side or the left side does not result in any significant correction of the underlying bundle branch block. So how do we manage these types of patients? So we had a series of patients uh, looking at our experience in a multi-center study published in circulation arrhythmia a few years ago. Here's the reason why combining the best of both worlds, both hispanal pacing and left ventricular pacing. So if you look at a patient with mixed conduction disease, not only there is left bundle branch block causing significant left ventricular conduction delay, even the intermyocardial conduction is significantly delayed, leading to further widening of the QRS. In these patients, if we can not only combine his bundle pacing, maximize native conduction, and on top of it, correct any underlying delay using left ventricular pacing in a sequential fashion. So here's one such example of a patient with a very wide left bundle branch block, 200 plus uh, millisecond QRS duration. And his bundle pacing results in this case, selectively correcting the left bundle branch block, but the QRS duration is still about 145 milliseconds. That itself is an indication for biventricular pacing but that was still about 40% reduction in the native QRS duration. But if we can pace sequentially, his, his bundle pacing followed by left ventricular pacing, you can further narrow the QRS duration as shown in the comparison here. So you go from 210 milliseconds to all the way to 110 milliseconds. Needless to say, this patient was a hyper responder. So when we looked at a series of about 27 patients, we were able to achieve this technique in about 25 of those patients. And you can see this significant improvement in QRS duration as an indirect surrogate marker of electrical resynchronization. Biventricular pacing results in modest reduction in QRS duration, but his pacing has a further reduction, but combining both gives us the maximal QRS reduction in these patients with complex mixed conduction disease. 
And we can achieve this in patients who are utilizing left frontal branch pacing also. So you can see in this example, a wide left frontal branch block here has duration of again 210 milliseconds. You can look at the 3D uh, electroanatomical mapping showing significant left-sided conduction delay in addition to diffuse slowing, but combining left bundle pacing and left ventricular pacing, we can further narrow the cure's duration. This patient with extensive scar and diffuse conduction disease. And while LV ejection fraction may not improve significantly, the mechanical resynchronization following the electrical resynchronization significantly improves the quality of life, functional status, and heart failure situation. So where do we go from here in terms of the future of CRT? We do not have long-term randomized controlled trials, but nonetheless, uh, each approach for cardiac resynchronization therapy, I believe should be physiology-based. Currently, whether it's right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, IVCD, in patients with wide QRS and heart failure, we use biventricular pacing as the gold standard. However, I think it's time to change the paradigm and build new evidence and our approach is in patients with right bundle branch block, use isponal pacing first. If there is significant or complete correction, that will be our endpoint. But if there is no correction or only partial correction, you can combine isponal pacing along with the focused left ventricular pacing and can lead to further QRS duration reduction. However, in left bundle branch block, still the gold standard is biventricular pacing. In these patients, we first attempt hispanal pacing. If we have complete correction, normalization of QRS, and if we can achieve it good thresholds, then we take it. If not, use left funnel branch pacing. On the other hand, if we have only partial correction, we combine conduction system pacing with left ventricular pacing from coronary sinus. In patients with IVCD, we tend to use combination uh, right from the beginning. And so this is being tested in a, a randomized controlled trial at a pilot study of 100 patients. We're going to utilize say, the heart CRT, his Purkinje conduction system pace resynchronization versus biventricular pacing. Hopefully we'll have the results within the next two years. Thank you very much for your attention. That's excellent as always, uh, Dr. Vijayaraman. We always learn something new from you every time you give a talk. Um, so I, I um, you know, I'd like to uh, to thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, just in the interest of time, we have about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, we would like to just open it up to the panel and uh, maybe go through a few questions. Uh, I would encourage the audience if they have any questions to put them in the Q&A as we go, since this is the last 10 minutes. But um, while we're waiting, uh, maybe we can ask the panel to each comment uh, on their perspective um, for some of these points, which I think are critical to advance this field forward. So um, I think let's start with uh, success rate. So I think uh, like Santosh and Valentina highlighted earlier, the success rates that we have with the current available technology, even though have dramatically improved since the late 2000s, there's still a scope for improvement in terms of success. So um, what sort of lead design or delivery system advances would you like to see in addition maybe to certain advances in device related or generator technology that can advance this field and take it to the next level so it is easily adoptable by most implanters? Um, we can go through each one of you, maybe Valentina, if you want to start followed by Santosh and Dr. Vijay. Yeah, you know, I, I would actually comment on the generators because um, as I mentioned, uh, with his one of pacing, the pacing threshold is a little bit higher, but it's not that higher that, you know, some of the devices uh, would still last a pretty long period of time. But I think that's one development I would like to see as there is a more widespread adoption of his one pacing, you know, very simply just um, increase battery longevity for these patients. Uh, that would be, I think, one of the most important things for long-term widespread adaptation. Santosh? I can comment on the lead. Um, you know, you asked a question about 
what kind of leads are we using 3830 versus style driven leads i think um you know for in our experience at least you know the 3830 gives us uh, pretty good success rates it's easy to handle it's um isodiametric design i think it's um easy to get into the septum i know there have been some reports on style driven leads um which are slightly bigger five french non isodiametric uh, they need to be prepped in a you know before implanting you need to make sure that the helix is out uh, you have to pretense so and even i've actually read um, reports about helix fracture in the septum so there are going to be issues i know people say you may get better stability with um, style driven leads i don't have any experience but you know, if I can get a 90% success rate with uh, luminless isodiametric design, you know, that's that's my um, opinion on the style of leads. I don't have any experience. Maybe Dr. Vijay Raman can comment on that. Yeah, so in terms of first uh, improvement in leads, I think while left frontal branch facing is a, a next best substitute for his frontal facing, his frontal facing is still the uh, I would say the, um, the ultimate uh, holy grail for the conduction system pacing. So we can improve on it by improving the lead. So one is we're attempting to use a traditional 1.8 millimeter screw to reach a structure that is almost two millimeter deeper. And we can get to the some of the his bundles which are somewhat more superficial. So improving the access to the deeper tissues, one, a uh, better uh, screw, and maybe a longer screw, slightly longer. And secondly, the steroid elution mechanism is not adequate in this. It's barely soaked in steroids, which has gone many times during the procedure itself. So a better steroid elution may improve it. So those two things may improve uh, access to the distal his bundle, even in patients with uh, intraacian conduction disease, we can achieve much higher success rate. And that same thing might work very well for left frontal branch pacing. But I would say with the current technology, it's complementary. So you get good thresholds with his bundle, if not move to left frontal branch pacing. And with the combination uh, in our lab, our success rates for bradycardia pacing is almost 97%. And so that's a huge improvement compared to the paper that you showed earlier. Um, with the stylet driven leads, my experience is limited. It adds additional steps, which we don't have to use for the 3830 leads. Um, I don't have a large experience to say one way or the other. It's a learning curve, just like anything else. Hopefully the more tools we have, we can achieve better success. Um, Dr. Vijay Raman, while we're still on that topic, there is a couple more questions from the audience. One is about uh, right-sided implants. Any tips for that? And second, I think since we already touched upon it, do you have any experience with using non-3830 leads? So right-sided implant, uh, we've published some of our uh, methods uh, previously. So uh, when we use uh, C315, his sheet, that's my preferred sheet for right-sided implant. We can reshape it to accommodate the acute curve at the subclavian to SVC junction. And um, we may have to torque the sheet a little bit more towards the septum with a counterclockwise torque. And that usually works pretty well. The fine manipulation that you can do with uh, left-sided implants is somewhat lacking with the right side, but nonetheless, you can achieve almost similar success rates. As far as the, um, the technique for um, stylet driven leads, um, with the hispernal pacing, again, you have to make sure that the um, screw remains extended. One of the challenges that even if you prepare the screw and have it fully extended, often the screw tends to go back as you push against or fixate against a fibrous membranous tissue. And so that's something you have to watch for. I have to look at it in multiple angles, uh, do cine, cine fluoroscopy to make sure that the screw is fully extended. And I've experienced some of this in the left funnel branch facing. The lead goes in nicely um, with a supporting sheath, but then the screw retracts back. So you have to make sure that your screw is fully extended even after you have penetrated the septum. And my concern is, will the screw retract later on after we implant? Because the screw is the active electrode. If it fully retracts back, then the thresholds can go up. 
So there has to be a mechanism to have, uh, that's one concern for me. The second concern I have is that um, because you practically borrow the leads, whether it's 3830 lead or uh, the styler driven leads, there's no mechanism to keep the lead fixated in the septum. And it's by chance that these leads remain stable, but there's still a good number of patients in our experience, and you have published this recently in circulation arrhythmia that the number of patients that lose left-sided conduction system pay capture is higher than what is being reported. Uh, it's probably close to 5%. I think his bundle and left bundle pacing almost similar because in his bundle, it's very obvious when you use loose conduction system capture. In left bundle pacing, you have to be extra careful to watch for that. And so it's important that once you implant the lead, the follow-up is critical for both types of leads. We might have time for just one or two more questions. One of the questions in Q&A is, you mentioned uh, Dr. Padala adjusting the AV delay to further narrow the QRS duration um, to really help uh, attain a really physiologic pacing configuration of the QRS. Any comments on how you do that, how you go through that process? Yeah, so, you know, you can start off, say, if for our first case, let's take an example. If the intrinsic PR was 200 milliseconds, you can start off um, the AV delays tight, like say, start off at 120 and gradually increase. When your AV delays are tight, you will see pure left frontal branch capture. That is, you will see either a QR or a RSR prime pattern. Now, slowly increase the AV delays and at some point you will completely lose the terminal R prime and you'll be able to normalize uh, the cure restoration. And as you keep extending, uh, you will have intrinsic left frontal branch morphology. So you have to uh, you know, check in um, the AV delays uh, at multiple intervals. See, each patient is different. It depends on the intrinsic conduction. So uh, based on those, um, values, we optimize the AV delays. Santosh, if may I add one little comment to that. So one of the critical thing for left frontal branch flux CRT type patient is that it's important to optimize when the patient is back in his room, fully awake, because yeah. in the lab, the PR can yeah. be uh, longer and you may have good optimization, but then when you come outside when the native conduction is better, you look like you have the left frontal branch block again. So uh, it's critical to do it in a fully awake state and program rate adaptive AV delay. I, I agree totally. We do it in the lab and then next morning, make sure they have completely normalized cures. All right, well, I think we're almost at time in, to respect everyone's time as well as our panelists who've given us their valuable time. I would like to go ahead and thank each and every one of the panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Kutifa, Dr. Padala, as well as Dr. Vijay Raman. Uh, I also want to extend a special thanks to Christina uh, Seen, who has basically helped us put together this webinar from the Cirque &E, uh, support team. And finally, a, a big thanks to uh, certainly uh, Jordana, who's been my, uh, my, um, my co-moderator in this session, as well as uh, to Dr. Wong for all of his leadership and guidance uh, through the rest of this. We will be having many more future webinars. Uh, Jordana, do you wanna introduce the next couple that we have coming up in April? Uh, so the next one is going to be on April 7th, and that will be from the AFib advisory panel. Uh, the exact topic to be uh, determined and will be forthcoming, but keep your eyes open for that one on April 7th. All right, excellent. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, hopefully this was productive for all of you and many more to come. This will be available as a recording um, on the Cirque &E website and we will try to reach out to all of you guys through different channels via social media to make it available. Thank you, have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.